This morning's readings come from, there are two this morning. The first one comes from John 13, verses 1 to 17. Just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come to leave his, this world to go to the Father. Having loved his dear companions, he continued to love them right to the end. It was supper time. The devil by now had Judas, son of Simon the Iscariot, firmly in his grip, all set for the betrayal. Jesus knew that the Father had put him in complete charge of every, everything, that he came from God and was on his way back to God. So he got up from the supper table, set aside his robe and put on an apron. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples, drying them with his apron. When he got to Simon Peter, Peter said, Master, you wash my feet? Jesus answered, You don't understand now what I'm doing, but it will be clear enough to you later. Peter persisted. You're not going to wash my feet, ever, Jesus said. If I don't wash you, you can't be part of what I'm doing. Master, said Peter, not only my feet then, wash my hands, wash my head. Jesus said, if you've had a bath in the morning, you only need your feet washed now and you're clean from head to toe. My concern, you understand, is holiness, not hygiene. So now you're clean. But now every one of you, but not every one of you, sorry, he knew who was betraying him. That's why he said, not every one of you. After he had finished washing their feet, he took his robe, put it back on and went back to his place at the table. Then he said, do you understand what I've done to you? You address me as teacher and master and rightly so. That is what I am. So if I, the master and teacher, washed your feet, you must now wash each other's feet. I've laid down a pattern for you. What I've done, you do. I'm only pointing out the obvious. A servant is not ranked above his master. An employee doesn't give orders to the employer. If you understand what I'm telling you, act like it and live a blessed life. The second reading this morning comes from Mark 10, 35 to 45. James and John, Zebedee's sons, came up to him. Teacher, we have something we want you to do for us. What is it? I'll see what I can do. Arrange it, they said, so that we will be awarded the highest places of honour in your glory. One of us at your right, the other at your left. Jesus said, you have no idea what you're asking. Are you capable of drinking the cup I drink, of being baptised in the baptism I'm about to be plunged into? Sure, they said. Why not? Jesus said, come to think of it, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptised in my baptism. But as to awarding places of honour, that's not my business. There are other arrangements for that. When the other ten heard of this conversation, they lost their tempers with James and John. Jesus got them together to settle things down. You've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, he said. And when people get a little power, how quickly it goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to be served, and then to give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Bethany. Beautiful job and beautiful words. And we are, we are continuing with that series. It's a mini-series, just two, last week and this week, which is Fit for a King, Signature Dish. And we said last week we'll be doing a second helping, and that's today. Seconds. You, did you used to say that at school? Are there any seconds? And if you were lucky, some food left, and it was, you could actually digest it. <laughs> then you got seconds, and at home as well, a second helping. Our God that we recognize is a God of generous proportions. In the Old Testament, it says this, that we in him, when he's our shepherd, then our life is like a cup that's overflowing, overflowing. And we can say, surely goodness and love, mercy is going to follow us every single day of our lives. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then we have Jesus with his words 
from John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 10. The enemy comes only to lie and steal, kill and cheat. But I have come, and what a contrast, that you might have life in all of its fullness. Without him, we know we're just living life, and it's not got the fullness, it's not got that abundance of generosity that it would have with him. And he said this. Well, we used this quote last week and then this second helping. In fact, we used the quote from the coronation, if you remember that young boy who approached King Charles III and said this very appropriately. We said, put him in his place appropriately. Your Majesty, the children of God's kingdom welcome you in the name of the King of Kings. And his response, you remember, was, I come in his name and I come to follow his example to serve, not to be served. But what King Charles and no earthly king can say is that full quote that we have this time. We did Matthew last week. Mark 10, 45. He came to serve, not, not, not to be served, and then to give his life in exchange for many who are held hostage, or some versions say as a ransom to pay that debt. No king, no earthly king can do that. Only Jesus. No one. You could give your life, but you could not cancel the debt for everybody else. Only Jesus. I hope, and, and thank you Estelle for the thanks to the children. I hope all you mums had a wonderful day last Sunday. I hope you stretched it out a bit beyond Sunday. That's, that's always a good thing. And that you get not only service or, or a meal fit for a king, but with extra, with second helpings of that as well. One of the things that we were able to do uh, just before that was to spend some time with, with our daughter on Mother's Day and with her three girls and her husband, Nick, as well. And it was lovely because, um, you know, I mentioned the discipleship square last week. D1, D2, D3, D4. D1 being you watch what's being done. That's what Jesus did, demonstrated. And then D2, he does it. You get to help him all the way around. And what was fun for us was that um, along with another couple, friends of theirs, they did something different for their birthdays. They normally buy gifts for each other. But they said this. Eve said, why don't we go to the spirit house? It has that cooking class. Has anybody ever been to that? Spirit House in Yandina? And so they went and did that, the forum, the two couples together and you know it's D1. Some of the great chefs show the um, signature dish, Asian dishes and they got to see that. Then they got to join in and do some of that you know in that live setting. It was kind of crammed an all day or weekend. And then they got to do that and be assisted, but what was really beneficial was they got to D4, do it at home, and we got to benefit from that. And we got to see, and they shared with us and showed us how they did it, and we got to see that and enjoy it, which is fun. Discipleship is about being guided by the Lord in terms of how we serve and why we serve and the gifts that we do it with, and then it's something that we can take and do with others as well. It's transferable, which is wonderful. Just before that, we'd had, following our message, we'd had, if you recall, we took a week, Chris and I, one of those not-so-fast weeks to kind of catch up with things and with each other. And one of the things we caught up with, it was, it was a meal from a Scottish clan. We've got three granddaughters here and a daughter. We've got a son in Scotland, and three other grandkids, uh, uh, two, two grandsons and a granddaughter as well. And he had sent his mum a gift, not for Mother's Day. That's still to come. But for her birthday, two years ago, <laughs> we still hadn't used it. It's the funny thing about gifts, isn't it? In fact, we were afraid we lost it at one stage. But what they had done, they'd gone online and they booked a meal for two in a very nice restaurant 
in Noosa. They're all a bit nice in Noosa, aren't they? These folks from Noosa are a bit high class, aren't they? A bit expensive as well. And we appreciated it, obviously, but Christy had been carrying that in her bag for two years. I thought, we better do this, but we've been waiting, as you do, you know, for an opportunity. Sometimes we wait too long, we miss out on things, but we thought, this is the time, we'll go when it's quieter, when it's not school holidays, and we'll go lunchtime, not, not in the evening. So that's what we did. It's a busy place, though, isn't it, Noosa? Hard to find a park, isn't it? <laughs> oh, and this is in the French Quarter, I won't mention the name of the restaurant, but... Too rich for us in every sense of the way. We wouldn't normally go there. And so we drove around and we couldn't find a parking place in that area. But eventually we found parking nearby, Umandi. You know, that's fairly close, <laughs> isn't it? So by the time we got to this restaurant, you know, we had our appetite. And Christine had already pre-warned me, you know, it's a bit high class. Not be as much food as what you normally like. But we can fill up afterwards. <laughs> we can go to, you know, your favorite Scottish restaurant, McDonald's. We can get something. So we, we went in. And yeah, it's a rich place for us. But it's been paid for. And we went in. And it's a beautiful spot. I mean, Noosa is a beautiful spot, isn't it? And that was fit for a king just to look at it because... Where the restaurant is, it kind of blurs the edges. You don't know if you're on the beach or actually in the restaurant. It was so nice. And it was sand as far as you could see, then ocean, and it was brilliant. There weren't many people around. And those who were in, apart from us, were, I could tell they were wealthy people. In fact, Joe Biden was there. Can you believe that? It's Joe Biden and the first lady. I nudged Chris. I said, don't look now. Joe Biden's over there. She had a look. She said, that's not Joe Biden. I said, well, it's a lookalike. He was sat there with his aviation sunglasses on, indoors. And his wife was sat there too, sunglasses on, looking very elegant and very wealthy. And actually, as I looked around, everybody kind of had that look, except for us. So, we ordered just the mains, not the entree, <laughs> forget the dessert and coffee, we'll just go with, the on we'll go with the mains. And it was beautiful, wasn't it? You thoroughly enjoyed it, didn't you? So we got our mains. And the waitress came past our table, not long after serving us, I must admit, and she went, oh, clean plates. And I felt like I should apologize, sorry. <laughs> We're not supposed to do that here, are we? You don't clean your plate in these pl places. You don't ask for seconds or bread to mop it up, you know. But she said it almost like, you know, I was thinking this, I shouldn't have said it out loud. Oh, clean plates. Oh, yeah, tell everybody. Go tell Joe Biden here. Like, look at these people. They've cleaned their plates. Bet you don't. But to be fair, I must admit, when she passed, I was licking the plate at that time. And, you know, oh, okay. And Christine, who'd had the rack of lamb, was sucking the marrow out of those bones. <laughs> yes, you were. Come on, you no need to be ashamed. <laughs> Talk about clean whistle. I mean, my goodness. We, honestly, we could have drilled holes in that. It would have been like one of those Peruvian, you know, <laughs> she could have played it. Because we're a bit thorough when it comes to those things. So... We're a bit standout here for the wrong reasons. And we asked, should you want a you know, dessert? We went, no, no, we'll, we'll have the bill. She brings the bill, the, the machine to us. We don't bring out you know, platinum credit cards or even pay on your phone. Christine brings out a big piece of paper, <laughs> like, pff, like a treasure map. <laughs> it's all crumpled and everything. And I'm feeling a bit you know, self-conscious here because this waitress goes, oh, clean plates, and a coupon. <laughs> I don't think you're supposed to say that out loud what you're thinking, you know, because... And a coupon. And it was a bit crumpled, wasn't it? 
I think you printed it on an A3. It was a bit big, you know. <laughs> we should have ironed it beforehand because it's been two years, but it's paid for. It's not a coupon. It's not, we do use them, by the way. In fact, I must say, in the States, Coupon Queen was her title. Just saying, it's another story. But it was paid for. Joe's paying, we're paying, or someone's paying for us. That was the significant thing to remember. And this, this was a wonderful thing, but just to remember as well, it was all paid for by somebody else because they love the mum, which was lovely. And when we come to this, this signature dish and second helpings, we need to remember who it is who's doing the main service for us. It's Jesus. And just as no one here could say, well, I'm going to give my life for the world, and we might do that, but it wouldn't have the effect that Jesus had. He's given that ransom. Not only did he come to serve, not to be served, but to give his life in exchange for those who are held hostage. And I love the way that the message, Eugene Peterson says that, because we think about ransom, but imagine being held hostage. Jesus sets you free. And this is the core, this is the thing we want you to remember with these past two, two messages, and it's this. Number one, when you are a disciple of Jesus, you're not Jesus' helper. That might sound a bit strange to you, and this next bit might even sound a bit offensive, but it's true. Let me say it in the nicest possible way, with love. Jesus does not need your help. Can you receive that in love? Because it's true. He wants you to be with him for all eternity in heaven. He loves you with an everlasting love. But you're not his helper. And he doesn't need your help. He invites you in love to serve with him. But you can only serve with him if you realize, first of all, we don't help him. Being a disciple means this. You've realized that you are in desperate need of his help. That's what it is. That's what a disciple is. I'm in desperate need of his help because I can't do this thing called life with all of its challenges on my own without him. I'm not supposed to and I can't. And it's to remember this, that we are not his benefactors or his sponsors. We don't sponsor the work of Jesus. We are part of that fellowship, empowered by him, but he's the sponsor. He's the benefactor. We don't give our lives in exchange for one day having eternal life with him. It's not, you know what they say, pie in the sky, by and by, when you die, it's meat on your plate whilst you wait. It's having that relationship with him now. And there's nothing that we could do that would possibly earn what we have, and that is that free gift of life from him. So that's what we remember first and foremost. And as we do this second helping, and we did read that passage um, about seeking the right and the left places of honor with Jesus last week, but from Matthew's gospel. This time it's Mark's gospel. We see something interesting in both Matthew and Mark, and that is in between. In, in Matthew, we had the parable of workers in the vineyard. Mark doesn't have that. He has the rich young ruler, that experience, you know, what must I do to enter eternal life, thinking that he's in control, and then the reality that, no, you can't do it on your own. You, you need God for that. And then the story of the two, James and John, seeking prime positions in power. But in between, there's like three verses in each gospel which stand out. We didn't read them last week. We didn't read them this week. But let me read them now. The same ones in Mark's and Matthew's Gospels. 
It's in Mark, it's chapter 10, and it's verse 34. Back on the road, they set out for Jerusalem. Jesus had a head start on them, and they were following, puzzled, and not just a little afraid. Listen to me carefully. We're on the way up to Jerusalem, Jesus said. When we get there, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the religious leaders and scholars. They will sentence him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Romans who will mock and spit on him and give him the third degree and kill him. After three days, he will rise alive. Both are mentioned by both gospel writers in between these two different events, which is interesting. Because right in the middle of the parable of workers in the vineyard, or the rich young ruler, and the two sons, one with the mother involved, one without the mother involved, right in the middle of that is the essence of Jesus' coronation and his kingship. That is, that his would be a crown of thorns, not a crown of gold. And he pointed this out to them, and it seems out of place that after that they could then be seeking privileged places on his right and on his left. And it reminds me of a story I heard from a good friend of ours, Tony Twist. Uh, with his wife Suzanne, he is uh, president of TCM, which is Take Christ to the Millions. For decades, that organization has been working with Christians, what was the behind the Iron Curtain and the, the wall way back. And they work from Vienna in Austria, in a small village called Heiligenkreuz, which is the Holy Cross. It's near the Black Forest. And for decades, they were smuggling out and smuggling in people from Soviet areas and blessing them and treating them medically and uh, dentistry and dressing them and encouraging them because it was easier to do in Vienna than anywhere else. And now it's much more open. But he told me a story about some, some Romanians. When I was there, there was Hungarians and Romanians and Russians. But he told me this story that, that the Romanians liked to tell. And it's about two, we call them gypsies, Romanis. And the story goes like this, and it was out of Romania when Ceausescu was in power there. It was two of these aging uh, gypsies, Romanis. And they decide that if they're going to settle down and have anything like a life in Ro um, Romania, they would have to join the Communist Party. They didn't agree with it, but they thought, oh, it's a means to an end. We don't have to believe. We'll just join. Make sure you've got the card. We'll be okay. So they sent in word that they'd like to join, and they were called for interviews, both of them. You've got to come for an interview. They went on the same day at different times. And the interview was this, very simple. It was led, the first one was led into a room. It was an office, and there was three large portraits on the wall. In the middle was a portrait of Jesus. On the right of Jesus, there was a portrait of Lenin. Vladimir Lenin, the uh, communist leader, obviously, and revolutionary. He started the Russian Communist Revolution all those years ago. He was on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side was a portrait of Stalin, who was leader and dictator, and really took them into uh, more trouble than even before, responsible for more deaths than Adolf Hitler, if you can imagine that. So you've got these three portraits. Jesus, you've got... Lenin, and you've got Stalin here. So the question to this Romani was simple. Which of these three do you recognize? Well, his face lit up straight away, and he smiled. He said, I recognize the one in the middle. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he crossed himself, took his crucifix, kissed it. Guy behind the desk wasn't impressed. He pressed a ding. Another man came out said, take him to the door, <laughs> escort him from the building. There's no way you'll make a communist out of him. So before he knew it, he was out the door and going out the building. But all these people are waiting to go in to be interviewed. And he saw his friend. So 
when no one was looking, he quickly leaned over to him and he said, when you go in, I'll show you three portraits. Whatever you do, do not admit to recognizing the one in the middle. And he went out. Eventually, it became his turn. And he went in, and sure enough, there were the three portraits. Jesus in the middle, Lenin to his right, and Stalin to his left. He sat him down in a chair and they said, now, which of these three do you recognize? So he said, smile on his face, I don't recognize the one in the middle. I have no idea who that is. But I recognize the two thieves that you've hung next to him. <laughs> the one on his right and the one on his left. Good is that? Underground humor. How good is that? And we know, because the Gospels tell us, Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, says this, that they crucified Jesus. And it says this, that the charge that was over his head was this, the King of the Jews. Very appropriate. The religious leaders tried to get it changed, if you remember. But Pilate said, no, what I've written stays what it is. And they crucified two thieves, one on his right and one on his left. And then we have this passage where following Jesus' announcement and expl explanation about going to Jerusalem, how he's going to die, we have James and John, two of the early followers of Jesus, James the first one, the sons of Zebedee came to him and said this, Teacher, we have something that we want you to do for us. You know you're kind of making it about yourself when you've got things and your prayers are, Lord, I have something that I want you to do for me, for us. What is it? I'll see what I can do. Arrange it, they said, so that we will be awarded the highest places of honor in your glory. One to your right, and the other to your left. Not the two positions you'd want when Jesus was crucified. And it's interesting because Jesus said, you have no idea what you're asking. No idea. Can you drink from the cup that I will drink from? Can you experience the baptism that I experience? And according to this, they said, oh yeah, we think we can do it. And Jesus said, well, come to think of it, you will. And come to think of it, they did. In fact, we know from history that James was the first apostle to die as a martyr. Others had died, like Stephen, the deacon, but he was the first of the apostles to be killed, says, by the sword, by Herod. Couldn't know at the time. And John was the last of the apostles. They all died, but he was the last. And some say the most cruel way for John and his personality because he was banished to the Isle of Patmos, which was the Alcatraz of the first century. I've been to Alcatraz as a visitor, not as an inmate. And I remember, and Chris will remember, it's freezing cold even in summertime. And they said one of the greatest punishments for being in Alcatraz when there is no escape, there is a movie, you know, Escape from Alcatraz, Clint Eastwood, good movie, probably didn't escape, just drowned, got out but didn't get anywhere else, was this. This was the cruelest thing because you could see the mainland, you can see the mainland clearly, and you can hear things from the mainland as well, but you can't get there. And they said, imagine this, that it's Thanksgiving, you can smell the roast turkey, cranberry sauce, but you'll never taste it again. You can hear people celebrate. And it's Christmas, you can hear the bells, you can hear people singing, but you can't join with them. It's New Year, you can see the fireworks. It's 4th of July, but you can't be a part of it. And this was John's thing. He could see the mainland, he could see people, but he couldn't be a part of it. It was a long and protracted. But they did this. And this was a later time, this was following Pentecost, which we'll celebrate next week, when they were empowered by Jesus, by his Holy Spirit. Before that time, as you can see, they still had some things that they needed to do. There were still some lessons they needed to learn. And one was about service. And it was this, that Jesus came to serve, not to be served. 
And if you remember, when Peter was faced with the prospect of Jesus washing his feet, he was shocked and not a little disgusted. Like that waitress when she saw me licking the plate, you know, she's disgusted. Or Christine sucking on those bones, this is disgusting. Not quite. But because you don't do this and you're not going to do this, it was the same Peter who said to Jesus, you're not going to die. I won't let that happen. And it was the same Peter who said, "And if you go to die, then I'll go and die with you. And Jesus said, you'll deny knowing me three times before the cock crows, which he did. We have ideas that we are better than what we actually are. But here's the thing. One of the hardest things for us as disciples of Christ is to know that in order to serve, you must be served first by Jesus. You must let Jesus deal with the dirtiest and most uh, awkward and embarrassing parts of your life on a regular basis. You must let him serve you because if he's not serving you, then you can't serve others. Your life's like a cup. We talk about the full cup principle. Whenever you serve another person, whether it's family, friends, or complete strangers, you're always emptying a bit of yourself out. If that's not being filled all the time, then you just wear out or burn out. But you need to be served. And Jesus said to Peter, and maybe saying it to you today, you don't understand this fully because we don't of the world but hopefully you will get it that unless I can serve you you can't serve others so it's not a one-off Jesus service to you it's a continuation so these are the things that we learn uh, from these passages and it's this number one that the Lord serves us as we serve others that's the only way it works if we're just serving out of ourselves it can never happen heard a true story of a missionary um, who was working with people with leprosy. And one of his supporting churches, someone went out to, to visit him. And he saw him when he was actually dressing someone's feet. Had leprosy. And as he took those bandages off, you know, the sight is very repugnant to us. And the smell, we get gagging reflexes because we're supposed to because, you know, meat that's bad and and he, and he couldn't watch it, and he couldn't, couldn't stand the smell. He had to absent it himself. And later on, he said to that missionary, you know what you did with that leper's feet? He said, I couldn't do that for a million dollars. And the missionary said, neither could I. It's not for that. It's God had empowered him and called him to do that by his spirit. He wasn't trying to earn his salvation. He already had that. But it was service, and he could only do it as the Lord was working through him and to him and serving him. First thing is that, service. You must be humble enough to receive that from the Lord, no matter how disgusting it might feel or wrong to you. The second thing is this, that he has given his life. He has given his life. That's adequate for everything. That's salvation. He's done what we can't do for ourselves and he's done it for you. Not as an exchange. This is not a transaction. When we serve, it's not as transacting transacting with Jesus. You've given us life, so we give you our lives back. It's rather, it's a response of love that we cannot really control and by his spirit he empowers us to do and calls us to do, but we can only do it with the reality of salvation and what that feels like. And how that changes everything. And then you want that for everybody else. And until he serves you, and until you know him as Savior, then you can't really. Anything else you do is good works, but it's not the same, and it's not sustainable. So God calls us to sustainables. So it's, we can serve in second helpings and in third and fourth for all of our lives, because of Jesus serving and saving us. He's at the center of everything. And hopefully at the center of our lives collectively and individually. But know this, I feel like God wants to say to you, there's parts of your life that you still held back from him 
Because they either disgust you or distress you and you don't think that Jesus would be interested. Well, he wants to touch those parts too. Would you let him serve you? Would you let him be Lord of all of your life? Would you pray with me? As Father, we do thank you for these words of Jesus that encapsulate the whole of the gospel. If it was just serve, that would be good, but it wouldn't be good news, but it has save as well. We thank you that we have been released from captivity, that we can't be imprisoned again, that the chains have gone because of Jesus, and we look forward to that celebration next week of his spirit that comes to enable and to work through us as well. The life of Jesus continued through us. And we bless his name, the name of Jesus. And Father God, we pray that we could be used, join with him, Jesus, in some way to make lasting changes in this community of Gimpy. We pray this in his name and to his glory. Amen. Let's stand together.